Okay, so um, this is the last session for today. And um, so we have one and a half hours, but one hour now we'll spend on this Crowd AI Winner Symposium. So I want to let you know, first of all, what you should expect and what this is. And then, of course, we have at the end, um, we have Armand talk from Facebook AI research. So I, I mentioned this in the beginning, right, what started as a small workshop idea. So you see this Crowd AI platform. So what is Crowd AI? So it's something that we built, um, and we only started early last year at crowdai.org. Uh, and so it's an open data slash open science platform. Because what we want to do is we want to have an open, in, in all meanings of the word, an open platform uh, where anyone can run any data science challenge that they want to. So it has a number of goals. Um, we started this essentially as um, a bit out of lack of alternatives, we, uh, as I said in the beginning, I'm a digital epidemiologist, so I'm trying to use, um, you know, data and technologies like uh, machine learning that are now, you know, heavily used, also on smartphones, usable to diagnose diseases. For example, plant diseases. We work on a very uh, hetero heterogeneous set of uh, issues, but plant diseases, crop diseases in particular, are, are of interest to us, and so. In the beginning, when I started with this many years ago, um, I didn't have any uh, machine learning expertise in the lab. And uh, you know, Pete's wonderful demo of TensorFlow <laughs> was yet uh, a dream. And so we wanted to reach out to, to data scientists to essentially help us with this problem of developing an algorithm, because reading up on the literature, it was clear that this was now possible. So we launched this platform. Now, while we launched this platform, we actually solved the problem, <laughs> um, but we still ran it, and this opened my eyes to something else, which is it's, uh, it's not only a great way to solve a data science problem if you have one, but also to verify it. Just because someone solves it doesn't mean it shouldn't be repeated by others. And in particular today, you will actually hear from two people who solved this plant uh, disease problem, and they solved it differently. But, but now we essentially have three independent versions uh, of solving the same problem, which I think, especially now that science is increasingly seen as having a bit of a, reproducibility, a reproducibility problem, I think that's a really uh, important aspect. So the second goal is then to educate how to do it, and I've only already talked a bit about uh, various efforts, and this is yet another effort. I think once people solve these challenges and they, they share with the world how these challenges can be solved, then obviously we can all benefit from it. So we're often asking people to write tutorials uh, on this platform as well, and here you see, for example, one that's written on the Dark Sky Challenge, and this will then go deeply into the details of how exactly uh, you solve this challenge, or the particular person who solved the challenge solved it, and you can just do it yourself. So that naturally begs the question, so how is this then different from the existing platform? Some of you may know Kaggle, uh, some of you may know more niche uh, platforms. So I think these are sort of the four reasons that come to mind to me. So it's a university-based project, it's not-for-profit. That makes a lot of things easier. <laughs> also makes some things harder, but it makes a lot of things easier. We have no need to think about how do we monetize users, and we can make it completely free to everyone, especially those with data challenges. When I approached Kaggle first, they, um, they were talking about tens of thousands of dollars for running this challenge. Um, we are 100% open source, so if you like the platform, you can help improve it. In fact, I mean, you just can clone and fork it if you want and build your own if you think uh, we're not doing this right. But the idea, of course, is to have multiple people to start to contribute to it so that we have an open, open source, open science, open data platform. It's completely scale and field indifferent, so you can run small challenges. It doesn't need to be the next big you know, $3 million prize healthcare challenges or what have you. It can be small, very small indeed, and it can be from very different fields, uh, whether, it's, whether it's hardcore machine learning challenge or whether it's uh, you know, something in a, in a slightly different field, but it's a data challenge, you can run it. And it's less about monetary prices. It's more about 
contributions, getting recognition. We, invite the, we invited all the winners to Switzerland, obviously to this symposium. You'll hear from them. Uh, and I think that's just as important as you know, some money. So in particular, uh, we went skiing yesterday also <laughs> with the winners of the challenge. It's a beautiful day. And so I think that's also something that's nice, uh, that you know, money cannot buy easily all the time. Good, so we had a bunch of challenges. I'm not gonna go through them in detail, but you can see they're mostly from our group, of course, uh, but then now others have started to use it. So there's a Penn State um, University project that ran and one is currently active. And so what we're now doing is we're pre preparing new challenges. We're quite excited to have a genetic challenge pretty soon, prediction of height from open genetic data. Open SNP is a database where people upload their genetic information. And we're now starting collaborations with other institutions. And if you're from another institution and would like to contribute, then please you know, get in touch with us. We really want this to be a multi-institution uh, thing. And um, one thing I also want to mention, especially to the educators in the room, whether it's industry or professors and so on, we're launching also a CrowdAI classroom um, where you can then run these challenges privately in class. Uh, so if you, you know, have a, a large class or a small class and you want to run challenges uh, during the class, but you want to do this privately, not in the public, you'll be able to do this as well. Okay, so uh, I just said we'd like to you know, embrace other institutions. And so in this uh, particular light, I'm, I'm very excited to introduce Ciro Catuto, who came to us here uh, today from Torino. He is the scientific director of the ISI Foundation, and he's gonna say a few words about um, how he thinks he could use CrowdAI for various projects. Ciro, please. Thanks, Maxon. Um, I'll be very fast. Basically, the ISI Foundation is a, a privately funded non-profit research institution. And the key here is the non-profit. Uh, the money into, into our institution comes from bank foundations, so it's philanthropic uh, money. And needless to say, these uh, this, this bank foundations are interested in unfolding uh, and in exploring further what is the impact that social data science, and in particular machine learning, can have uh, for their mission, for philanthropy. So we, we have recently uh, worked with the three uh, largest Italian bank foundations in mapping out uh, what is the landscape uh, of potential or existing impact of machine learning and data science in general for, for social good, uh, for the so-called third sector. And, and as a result of this, uh, um, we, we've been interacting with many organizations who've been working in this space already. You might know the work of the United Nations Global uh, Pulse Office, uh, led by Robert Kirkpatrick. Uh, there is a unit doing very cool work at uh, UNICEF, led by Natalia Adler. Uh, you might know of DataKind, which really launched this, uh, uh, this, this type of activity. Uh, the Data Guild, Reboot, uh, TechFugees, Social Cops, uh, you name it. Uh, we've been mapping this, this problem space, and, and clearly there is uh, a lot that this community represented here can do in terms of bringing to bear what we can do uh, for, pro for problems that are very broad for society and that are really tough challenges going ahead. Um, one key point uh, is how to bring together the private and public actors that are uh, needed, that need to work together in order to tackle these problems. Uh, GovLab at NYU has been working quite a bit under the leadership of Beth Novak and, and Stefan Wellhurst on, on, on the notion of data collaboratives, on, on, on bringing together uh, different type of competencies uh, in unleashing the, the value of data and, and really creating the foundation upon which you can build data projects that really deliver impact. And we've been fleshing out together with them and the organization mentioned above a few case studies. Uh, let me give you an example because I understand that what I said so far has been very, you know, very, very high level, very fluffy even. Um, so let's go down to a very specific case. This is uh, the largest refugee camp in the world. It's called the Dadaab Camp. It's about 100 kilometers inside Kenya near the Somali border. It's, it's, large, it's a large place, in fact. It's three times the size of Lausanne. It's been there for uh, uh, 25 years. So there are people uh, your age uh, who have lived there for most of their life. And, and it will be closed in May this year. So now you have the, the equivalent population of three cities of Lausanne vanishing uh, in, in about four months. And, and there is a, a big challenge, a big humanitarian, humanitarian sorry, 
challenge here in forecasting where this population will flow and trying to, to, to allocate, try to help out the organization, especially UNICEF, uh, to actually allocate resources that, so that we can mitigate the impact of this, uh, uh, of this, of this big issue that, that we are facing. Um, and so we, we partnered up with GovLab, with UNICEF, uh, and as you imagine, there is a lot you can do in terms of remote sensing, machine learning, uh, computer vision, deep learning on images and, and features that you can uh, uh, detect on the ground. We will be doing this a lot. And given the non-profit nature of our institution and the non-profit nature of this project, uh, it was very natural to, to imagine that uh, the, the, the crowdsourcing machine learning competition could only happen on the most open platform which is available right now. And so it was only natural to, to start collaborating and talking with Marcel and his team about this. So I'm very pleased to, um, to share that we will be working uh, with CrowdAI on, uh, on this project on a number of other projects. Uh, and so stay tuned for a number of data science for social good uh, challenges, and I look forward to see uh, what this community can do in this space. Thanks for your attention. All right, so in that same spirit, and before we go to the winners, um, I'd like to now introduce uh, Mohanty, who is a PhD student in my lab, and uh, he's going to announce a challenge that we have we're just about to launch uh, in collaboration with uh, Stanford University. Please. Yeah, it seems to. All right, hi guys, I'm Mohanty. I'm a doctoral student uh, with uh, Marcel. And so this is uh, a new challenge we're about to launch with our friends at uh, Stanford. And uh, the challenge is to kind of teach an AI to how to walk. As in, before they can go out uh, in the universe and colonize the whole universe, they need to know how to walk. But the premise here for this particular uh, study is uh, uh, these guys, they want to uh, study how uh, humans work, uh, how humans walk. And the reason is that many neurological di uh, diseases, basically, they find their symptoms in uh, walking disorders. And to be able to kind of properly understand uh, what these symptoms mean, we need to understand how we humans work, uh, walk. And uh, to understand how we uh, walk properly, we will have to first teach uh, an AI how to uh, walk. So again, in this particular problem, we uh, kind of run the whole challenge in a um, uh, biomechanical physics environment uh, called as OpenSim, where uh, you are given a musculoskeletal model and uh, you have control of 16 muscles. And every 10 milliseconds, uh, your job is to trigger one or any of these muscles. And the goal of the challenge is to make it walk, or better run, uh, as far as you can uh, within uh, five seconds. Or if we have a lot of good submissions, there will be a marathon of a lot of AI uh, runners. And we will see who kind of goes uh, till the end. And apart from that, um, so just to get you started also, this whole, problem, uh, the whole challenge is not about uh, kind of solving a problem, but also to help uh, uh, other people who are interested in the whole domain or other people to help learn. So for this, what we have done is we have worked really hard to make it very easy for anyone to get started. We kind of give you some example code and uh, all the environments nightly pa uh, 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 re uh, packed really well so that you don't have to spend a lot of time setting things up. Some example code, for example, this is an example code where uh, what happens if you randomly select some uh, muscles and hope it works. It does not work, it falls really badly over and over again. And uh, so then we also give you some template code to get you started and also some more resources on how to uh, use, uh, for example, this is a classic problem where we want to see if reinforcement learning can uh, be a good way to approach this problem. So we'll be adding more uh, resources on how to help you get started in uh, reinforcement learning. And we, uh, yeah, so, and also uh, there's this whole visualize thing. So basically for every uh, submission you make, you will have a visualization uh, like this where you can see how your baby AI uh, walks, if at all uh, it can. And apart from that, uh, now we are almost ready to uh, launch it. So I will take this opportunity to launch the challenge before I invite you all to take part in it. Yeah, launching challenges on CrowdA is very easy. So if you have interesting data sets, this is all you need to do. So, oh, <laughs> come on. Okay, there's a small glitch, it seems. But it, I will fix that after this. Sean, are you around? <laughs> Sean. <laughs> All 
<laughs> okay, let's assume it's uh, already launched. So now we invite all of you to come in and uh, learn about reinfo uh, reinforcement learning if you do not know uh, about it already, and we will help you learn. Uh, we, we will help you take the first baby steps in reinforcement learning. Uh, or if you have some experience in reinforcement learning or are passionate about this problem, we would really uh, be delighted to have you uh, put in submissions. And what do you get out of it? One, of course, um, it's fun to be able to create a baby AI which walks or runs or jogs. Uh, second, also for prizes, uh, uh, that needs to be uh, clearly uh, laid out later, but uh, I think uh, uh, by tradition the winners will be uh, invited to the next applied uh, ML days and uh, we're also working out how we can uh, have um, a sponsored visit to uh, our friends, uh, to the group of our friends at Stanford and also uh, a possible co-authorship of a really good paper on uh, how basically we can make uh, musculoskeletal uh, simulations using uh, reinforcement learning. Thank you so much. All right, one can always rely on the demo effect. I'm just gonna close this so you can plug in. Okay, and uh, is this on? No, this is not on. Well, I think you can hear me. Um, but while Andre is setting up, so Andre is also from ISI, uh, by coincidence, but he submitted um, the best solution to the Plant Village uh, challenge, and so he's one of the two winners. So what you're now gonna see are four people who submitted uh, solutions to the challenges and won the challenges. And uh, there are two challenges here, and so we, we awarded the, you know, we chose two winners per challenge. So I'll, I'll, I asked them to give uh, short presentations. We didn't, I didn't check these presentations or anything, so it's an experiment for us as well, but I'm quite, uh, I'm quite sure it's gonna be great. So thanks a lot, so it's Andre. five minutes, I have time, right? Uh, no, this should be 10. <laughs> okay, okay, so I have 10 minutes, uh, so uh, thanks uh, Marcel for presenting me. Just seeing a few more words about, about me, so uh, the type of research that we do. We have uh, a data science laboratory at ISI Foundation, so we do a lot of research, mainly with uh, um, analysis of uh, text uh, data sets, uh, trying to understand uh, how the collective attention of people, how they, uh, uh, they are around different topics, how topics change uh, in time, uh, topics and geography, things like this, and also uh, different projects that produce like uh, nice pictures, so these are the nice pictures. Um, and, uh, this is uh, in, in my work, so in my free time, I also try to participate in different uh, uh, competitions in Cloud.ai and in, in Cargo. So this pre presentation will not be about my projects, it will be about one of these, uh, these uh, competitions in Cloud.ai. So the, uh, the competition was uh, this uh, Plant Village, this is a classification challenge. Uh, the idea in the presentation is really to, in the next uh, nine minutes, to present you uh, um, a walkthrough, or a, a small tutorial, a fast tutorial, on how to arrive to the results that arrived uh, in, this, in this challenge. So the idea here is really to use this data set of uh, images of plants, uh, and uh, each image is a different class. You have 38 classes with plants and, and different diseases, and it's just a, 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 just a image classification uh, problem. So uh, there are already many models that uh, you can use for this. So what uh, I'm going to use, uh, like uh, the first thing that I'm going to do, like uh, is really to set up, set uh, what's the baseline that I want to achieve for this, uh, uh, for this uh, example. So if you don't know, uh, this is the paper from Marcel, like about the, the experiment that they did, uh, using uh, the first time that they used deep learn for this, uh, deep learning for this uh, image, image classification problem. So what we want to achieve in this case is this uh, precision of 0 0.97. Uh, it's already very high, and uh, the idea is really to try to uh, match and go, for, uh, go beyond this, uh, this precision. Uh, so uh, first thing, reproduce it. So the idea, what I'm going to use here is this, uh, you have to have good software and good uh, hardware also. So I'm going to use uh, CUDA, CUDNN, uh, CAFE, and this uh, platform that is called NVIDIA Digits, that is uh, very easy to, 
load your data set and run different uh, types of uh, models over, it, over this, this data set. So um, this is uh, uh, the page that you have. Uh, it's a web page that you have on your uh, desktop when you start NVIDIA, uh, NVIDIA Digits. It's uh, available also on GitHub if you want to take a look on the last improvements on this platform. So there is a GitHub uh, uh, repository. Uh, so uh, you have to start by creating the data set. So uh, you have first download the data set and then you, can, uh, uh, you have to point the training images and then load it and create this data set. So what you have after creating this data set is this uh, data set that you can explore. So you have uh, the, the different uh, the, the images loaded and also the different classes that you can explore. So these are the, the, the uh, 38 classes. You can explore what are the image, images that are in these uh, different classes and so on. So after loading the data set, you can start creating the model. So the idea here is I'm going to create a simple model using this, uh, this platform and using this plant village data set that they just created. Then uh, I'm going to use Google Net, that is one of the uh, networks uh, available on this platform. It's available both in Cafe and Torch. So I'm just selecting uh, Google, uh, Google Net on Cafe and uh, what are the uh, hardware that you want to use. So as you can see, I have uh, some GPUs that I can use uh, and I'm going, I'm going to use that. Uh, so the Google Net is this one, uh, okay, this one. So it's uh, a, a, a very uh, deep neural network with, with uh, very different, uh, many convolutional layers on it. Uh, this is one, the one that we are, I'm going to use. And then you start uh, fit, uh, fitting your model and this is where the hot things uh, start to happen. So uh, it, it's uh, really hot, so uh, it's better if you use like in winter days because it, it becomes hot. hot. <laughs> and okay, uh, so uh, after finishing, then uh, you have this uh, model that you can check what are the output, like the, the, the different, uh, ac the, the accuracy for the model. So uh, in the graph, you'll see that there is these different uh, um, measures that you can check. So for example, the accuracy that I had for this model that I just trained was 97.1. Uh, it's already uh, almost matching the, the one that, uh, that uh, you saw on the paper. Uh, an, an, another important thing is the loss that uh, you are trying to minimize. So uh, uh, you are trying both, uh, trying to maximize the accuracy, but in the, in the meantime, you are trying to, to, to minimize this loss there. So uh, this is the first try. Then what you are going to do once you have that, you have to refine your model. So this is this where comes the model selection part. And this is one of the most important parts of the uh, machine learning uh, process. <coughs> so the idea is that you have different parameters and you have to, uh, to, to find which one is the best for your data set. So uh, the, the example that I'm going to give you is uh, trying to refine what is the best learning rate for this uh, case. So the, the one that I did show earlier was, uh, was using a, a learning rate of 0.01, and then going to change, to change to half of it, like 0.005, and uh, using different also uh, steps for decreasing this uh, learning rate. So the idea is that uh, you start with uh, some learning, ra learning rate, after, for example, 33% of, of your process, you decrease it by uh, multiplying by uh, 0 0.1 and so on. Uh, in, the second, in, in, in the second model, I'm using a lower run, uh, learning rate to start and also decreasing it, uh, uh, multiplying by 0 0.2 at every 25% uh, of the process. Then uh, uh, the final results, uh, I have a, a slightly better accuracy. So if you check the difference, it's just uh, um, something like 10%, 10, to 10 or 20%, uh, around 10, 20% uh, more uh, higher accuracy. The loss also is uh, a bit smaller than, than before. So this is uh, one, uh, one uh, thing that you can try to submit. You, are, you already uh, have uh, better results than what you had, uh, for example, on the paper. Um, so, uh, this is one thing that you, uh, that you can do. Uh, so 
Another thing that you can do uh, is to use this platform to explore what you have on the model. So for example, one thing that, that, that you can do is to test uh, your model for one single image. So if you select an image and test your model for this image, you have uh, what are the activations for, the, uh, for every single layer that you have in your model. So there are many, many layers you can, uh, that you can go through all the layers, but uh, the important information that you'll find, for example, here I'm focusing in one of the layers, and you can see that if I'm using the learning rate of 0 0.01, uh, I don't know if you can see in the images, but there is one where the activation units are more activated than, than the other one. So for example, in the, in the second case with a learning rate of 0 0.04, 0 0.004, I have uh, more units that are act activated. So because uh, uh, that there are some, uh, some properties like uh, uh, wh why this is happening? Like, uh, uh, if you start with uh, a lower learning rate, what happens is that what you are trying, uh, each, each one of these layers, uh, the activation units <coughs> are ReLUs, uh, rectifier linear units. <coughs> so uh, what you are trying to find, uh, like in this activation uh, layer, is really uh, uh, what's uh, the best point in this, uh, in this function that, uh, uh, that, that you can use to, uh, to predict uh, your data. So every unit, every pixel that is, you see in this image is a different, different uh, 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 ReLU that you have. So uh, the point is that if you have a high learning rate, you can miss the point and go to the point like uh, I can see you. I don't know if I can show you the mouse now. Maybe with a pointer. Here, this area here, that area there where you have uh, uh, negative values, you see that the gradient there, there is zero. So if you find, if you go to that point and uh, uh, your gradient is always zero, you are not going to improve your model anymore because your ReLU is dead, okay? You, it's not going to activate anymore. So uh, you see that in this case, with a learning rate of 0 0.01, you have many dead uh, ReLUs while with uh, the other learning rate, you have uh, much, many other uh, ReLUs that are uh, activated. Uh, the problem with, uh, could be that uh, with this, in this case, with uh, more ReLUs activated, you have uh, 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 more par uh, uh, parameters that, that are active. So there is a, a higher chance of overfitting. Uh, so, okay, so final steps, you create a data set with all images, you train the model on this data set, predicted classes, trust your model se selection, cross your fingers and submit. <laughs> that's it, uh, that's what uh, I did. Then uh, what could be done next? So, and things that I didn't try, but uh, it, should, it could be uh, easy to try. Uh, there are more parameters that you can uh, try, like that there are three layers of drop, uh, with uh, dropout, that you can uh, change the dropout rate. Uh, you, can, uh, you have three uh, loss uh, uh, layers where you can change the loss weight for, for, for these uh, three different layers. You can use different network ar architectures, and you can use also data augmentation that is different from transfer learning. It's just you take your data set and you just uh, play with the images that you have in the data set. Uh, so uh, that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I think in the interest of time, we're we're uh, moving on. But all of these guys are uh, will be at the dinner, and uh, so please ask any questions tonight. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Do, 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 do. Interval screen. Well, uh, another application that we got that was uh, great is from uh, Shashank Chilamkurti, and he's going to talk about also uh, leaf disease classification, but this time using a ResNet. Thank you. Okay, so hi, I'm Shashank. So I work at uh, Q.A. It's one of the startups you're going to mention, which apply deep learning to medical images. 
So we apply deep learning to, say, brain tumor segmentation and mitosis detection and so on. Uh, okay, let's go on with the challenge. So as Andrea has described, so this is a challenge is about the classification of the diseases of the leaf. So we have 20K images total, on total. So that's about 500 images per class. And thing is, we were not allowed to use transfer learning. So 20K images might not be might not be huge enough to create a general model, but thankfully images are nicely pre-processed. Okay, so, uh, so for the solving the challenge, CNNs are the way to go. I mean, I have tried uh, other challenges. I have I've tried, so using the old um, classical CV techniques, they don't work so well, and it's much harder to have it working. Uh, so I have first started with Keras, and I then switched to Torch. Um, so uh, I have used a lot more augmented strategies. I have used random sizing of random sizing of the crops. So I have used contrast enhancement and so on. So a lot more augmentation strategies. And I have used so ResNet architecture, so which was implemented in Torch, and I got like 0.99 in score. It's, it's almost it looks almost perfect. Uh, unfortunately, it's it's not very generalizable yet to real world images, as is shown in the paper written by Marcel. So, so for convenience, I have written a blog which describes the code and open sourced it. So you might want to look at it and modify it. So, so I'll I'll just give some recommendations to get started. It might be daunting uh, to get started in deep learning. There's so many. There's so many uh, jargon words you would find around, which you might not like, which might get make it harder to start. So I suggest if you're starting with deep learning, you should start with Keras. It's it's like TensorFlow, but dumbed down to like make it fast to uh, prototype. Uh, and there are a few landmark papers that you should read. Uh, something like uh, AlexNet paper, so paper by Chris Alex Krisowski and ResNet. So the main uh, thing about the challenge is to tune the parameters. There's so many of them. So ma mainly it's just learning rate and batch size. Uh, but still there's so many parameters that, that you can tune. Um, and there's so many this folk knowledge or tricks in the deep learning that you would not find unless you read the papers themselves. So it, it might be in your, it, so if you're getting started, you should read a few papers before doing anything. And pre-processing usually helps quite a bit. So, so uh, for example, so I'll show you the images again. So, so in, this, in this case, all the, so all the leaves are nicely kept on a background and they are at a very front or parallel angle. So make, making it easy for the network to classify. So if, if your data set doesn't have something very nice structured, you might want to spend some time pre-processing it. So yeah, so that's it. So you have any questions? All right, thank you very much. If there's an immediate uh, question, we can of course take it, given the time. Otherwise, of course, Shashank will also be with us tonight. Good? Sure. All right. Thanks Thank very you. much. OK. There we go. All right, so Min Yu comes to us from uh, Vietnam. Uh, view full screen. We ran a challenge on nighttime images that were collected by the International Space Station, not because we do, at the moment, nighttime image research, but it just seemed like a cool data set. And uh, some of our colleagues who had actually used crowdsourcing to label the images um, also challenged us a bit, um, saying that this would not be possible. 
uh, to do. And so here we have two solutions to that. So the first one is from Min Yu. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nguyen Minh Hill, and I'm from Hanoi, Vietnam. Uh, this is the first time I uh, come to Switzerland, and uh, it's my pleasure to talk here. So uh, in our company, CK Studio, um, we try to de develop solutions for automatic image moderation. Uh, that means that we try to detect the offensive, offensive image like uh, pornographic um, or violent image, and that brings me uh, to uh, trans transfer learning which is to retrain, return, or uh, adapt the mod model chain on uh, one domain to another domain. The transfer, transfer learning would speed up the um, chaining process, and it work also works well in many cases. So when I see the, um, this uh, challenge, this uh, class classification of nighttime image, um, I uh, use uh, transfer learning techniques that I was already familiar with, and uh, there is, uh, as you can see, there are seven labels in uh, this data set. It's um, so the, uh, the role is to try to detect the input image. Uh, from the input image, we want to know if um, that image is uh, Arsenal, Aurora, Black, or City, or something else. So uh, in the past, um, when we, we want to cl cl classify image, we often use some, uh, uh, we try first, we try to make mm, some feature from the image. We use some image processing technique to try to detect the edge in the image, or, or try to make the his historic RAM. Um, and then we use a feature to change a cl classifier. So, but recently, the um, deep neural deep neural network that uh, outperform uh, the chat this in the methods uh, on image classific classification um, in the image uh, image net uh, competition. Uh, the best one always uh, use the uh, deep neural, deep neural network or convolution neural network. So in the convolution neural network, there is many layers, like convolution, pooling, drop out, fully connected, and the last one is submark layer. So um, the model I use is pre-chain on the image net um, competition. And the, they, they have the one million image training set with 1,000 categories or 1,000 class. The class is, um, Various um, from uh, animal to vehicle, as you can see. So the, uh, why we use a pitch and model? The reason is it's faster. Um, in 2012 or 2013, when they try to change the model on the immediate data set, it would uh, take a week. But now it's reduced thanks, thanks to the hardware de development of the CPU. Um, so um, another reason is it, it would avoid uh, overfitting in case of a small chaining set. Um, for, for example, <laughs> these three images has a blue background, and if we only have a like uh, ten image, the the network may may focus on the blue background instead of the target object on the image. But if we use a pre-chain model on the image net, it's already chained on million images. <laughs> So it is know how to deal with this. So we, uh, I chain transfer learning the model chain from Imanet to the classification nighttime challenge. So uh, the structure of the, the network, the, this one is uh, Inception V3. Uh, uh, at the time of this challenge, uh, this is the newest one that I, uh, I see. But, uh, but now, they, maybe they have better, better architecture like Inception ResNet V2, which combines the Inception, uh, Inception and ResNet architecture. So in the deep neural network, the lower layer would try to detect the edge, uh, and the middle layer would construct the shape from the edge, and, and the output would be, would be the, the confidence score or prob uh, probabilities of the class, of the target class. 
So this is my um, architecture. I um, remove the last layer, the top layer, um, which is uh, 1,000 categories, and I replace it with uh, uh, some layer with six class, seven class, and I fine tune the whole network. Uh, not only the last layer, but I fine tune the whole network. So the performance is uh, like 85% accuracy and uh, one, about one second per image. So there is also a tutorial on the cloud AI website. So if you want to know more detail, maybe you can check that. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, unless there are burning questions, I would suggest we move on, and you're also obviously here tonight, so thank you. All right, so the last one in this um, Crowd AI session is um, this one. Okay, whoops, thanks. <laughs> okay, uh, no, this we already had. Sorry, wrong one. This one, okay. All right, so this is the second winner of the nighttime images. Uh, this is by Pritham Putta, so also a submission uh, from India. And I'm gonna go into full screen mode here. And the stage is all yours. Uh, hi everybody, uh, this is Pritham. I work for a startup called Q.AI. I'll give you a disc different dis description of it. Uh, basically, we are trying to uh, build a decision uh, support tool for clinicians and radiologists to help them uh, diagnose medical images quickly and precisely. So uh, we obviously use deep learning on medical images to try to do as much as we can. Um, moving on quickly, uh, I won't talk much about this because this is all being talked about. So this is essentially a classification task with seven classes and we had about uh, 10,000 images per class uh, for the training data. Uh, I'll brief briefly describe wh what I did and how I did it. Uh, I basically used a ResNet uh, with 18 layers. You can ski, uh, see the schematic of uh, schematic on the right. Uh, it is b basically the building block of the network I've used. Uh, it's also called the uh, residual block. Uh, that's what the uh, rest means in the residual uh, ResNet. So uh, it has a convolution batch norm ReLU and then a convolution again batch norm. So if you see that addition, that's what is new uh, with ResNet. So the, uh, the convolutions which they are using, uh, they don't change the size of the image. And uh, once you reach the uh, uh, fifth layer, that is the batch norm layer, you can uh, add the uh, inputs to the output of the batch norm. So what that will do is it will force the network to s learn uh, something called uh, residuals which uh, you again talked about uh, in the morning uh, so uh, this is also known to help uh, gradient flow because there are all these shortcuts uh, and so this also in turn helps uh, you to train deeper neural networks so uh, this one the uh, image net challenge in the uh, in 2015 uh, another thing i used uh, transfer learning i used i used a resnet uh, 18 which is, which was pre trained on the image net uh, and then th there was a problem which I ran into, which is basically the class imbalance. Uh, we didn't have uh, equal em equal number of images for uh, each of the class. So what I did was I used a weighted cross entropy, uh, which basically gave uh, more weight to uh, classes which are underrepresented in the data set. And also uh, overall undersampling uh, of the images. Basically, I'll I'll pass the uh, same image multiple times if that is underrepresented, and I'll pass. Uh, lesser number of images than the, than uh, they are in the data set uh, if they are uh, overrepresented. And uh, to reduce overfitting uh, and to make my model uh, invariant to these uh, uh, these things, so uh, I've done these data augmentations, basically uh, translation, rotation, horizontal and vertical flips because you would expect the model to be invariant to these transformations. So basically, uh, when I pass an image into the uh, model, uh, I randomly do one, these transformations with some parameters. Say I rotate uh, randomly between 0 to 5 degrees, or I translate between 0 to 5 pixels, 
and then I randomly flip horizontally with uh, some probability, 0.5 say, and also vertical flips. Uh, this will basically uh, help reduce overfitting, uh, I mean, improve the performance on the, uh, on the test set. And uh, the last one is the most well-known trick probably. I've trained a bunch of models and then took uh, a majority vote among them. I've trained five resonates uh, with different initialization conditions and then uh, finally when uh, in inference, uh, I, I take the majority of what the uh, five networks are saying. Uh, so that is basically it. Uh, with this approach, uh, I've uh, achieved 86% accuracy on the uh, dask, dask case challenge. And uh, yeah, so basically uh, one recommendation which I find uh, very interesting is that uh, Jan Likun sometimes said, uh, some time ago said that uh, basically if you want to train a model, you increase your capacity as much as you can until the accuracy decreases and then regularize the hell out of it. So basically you try to increase your model capacity, increase the number of parameters until the accuracy decreases and then uh, you try to regularize it and that will probably be the best, best model you can get with the data you have. So yes, that's it. Uh, questions? <laughs> All right, so I, I think we'll do the same thing. Um, okay. And uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Um, can, you, can, you, uh, can you generally help me give these guys a huge round of applause? I mean, it's not easy uh, to come on stage here. And